Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Jeff Cummings, the host of The Baton, a John Williams musical journey. Now, this podcast series is complete, of course, and this is a very special bonus episode. Now, it's a special bonus episode because this one doesn't just focus on one score. And as you can see, it's a video episode, which I didn't do before. And I'm also not going to be doing this alone. I have invited my co-host from the show for quote unquote virtual roundtable to talk about the music of John Williams. So let's not waste any more time. Hi, everybody. Great to see you. How are you guys doing today? Doing great, Jeff. Jeff. Hey, doing good. Good to see everyone. Really good. Excellent. Good to see you. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, good to see everybody. Good. good. Look at this. I mean, this is probably the, the largest virtual gathering of John Williams fans we've had. I mean, we've got 18 people here. Um, and about half of you I'm actually seeing for the first time because we recorded our episodes over the phone. And um, um, putting, the, putting the faces to the, the voices is, is just a lot of fun. And you're going to get a chance to um, – Talk a little bit more, and I bet you a lot of our people watching be like, wow, I like that. You know, to put the voices to the, the face. Um, so I want to give everybody the opportunity to introduce yourself. So we'll go in alphabetical order, and I want you to say where you live, um, the shows on the baton that you co-hosted, and your favorite John Williams score. So let's start with uh, Maurizio Caschetto. Here I am. Hello, Jeff, and thank you for having me and all of us uh, all together here. Um, I'm based in Italy, uh, as probably uh, some of you may know, because uh, I'm now actually entering in my third year of managing the Legacy of John Williams website, uh, which also has a podcast show of its own, uh, which launched a little bit uh, afterwards, like you, Jeff, launched your own. So basically we started a similar adventure uh, pretty much at the same time. Um, well, in terms of uh, John Williams' scores, my favorite, well, it's very difficult to have just one. And of course, the answer might be probably the most obvious one. Uh, at the moment, it's probably E.T., the extraterrestrial. But if you ask me tomorrow, it's probably another one. So <laughs> let's say that I pick E.T., the extraterrestrial for now. Okay, and which episodes did you co-host? Oh, well, I was with you uh, first for The Fury, the 1978 film by, by Brian De Palma with Stunning School by John. And then I came back a little bit later for The Accidental Tourist, which is another one of my absolutely favorite John Williams scores. Cool. All right, so next up is Jens Dietrich. So I had to unmute myself there. Uh, uh, thank you, Jeff. Well, uh, you guys probably know me as being at least a part-time host of the Goldsmith Odyssey. Um, I'm living in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, I contributed to the uh, Baton with Images, which is one of my favorite John Williams scores, though I guess my favorite is Empire Strikes Back, just because it's objectively the best one. Though, you know, if you ask me which one I listen to the most, it's probably The Lost World. Very interesting. Okay, Paulius Edokus, your turn. Hello, everyone. Hello, Jeff. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, it's been so fun uh, co-hosting the show with you. Um, I live uh, currently in a small town uh, just south of Norway, south of Oslo in Norway, uh, and uh, been living here for about five years. Uh, before that, I, I studied in Scotland, and before that, I lived in Lithuania, so a lot of different places now in Norway. Uh, my favorite score is probably Empire Strikes Back, although it, it really depends because I just listen whatever my mood is uh, at the moment. So it kind of varies. Sometimes I listen to the Empire Strikes Back, sometimes to, to Jurassic Park, the, the poster shanks uh, 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 towards the back there. Um, so um, uh, the the podcast that uh, the podcast episodes that I hosted were the uh, the the Prisoner of Azkaban, uh, <coughs> the Prisoner of Azkaban, and the three Star Wars sequel. Uh, Trilogy scores: uh, the uh, The Force Awakens, The Last Jedi, and The Rise of Skywalker. All right, thank you, Paulius. And next up is Doctor Richard Fish. Hey there, Jeff, and thank you so much for gathering all of us John Williams fans together. Um, although it certainly it looks like I live on Mos Eisley, 
uh, in the most wretched collection of scum and villainy, something like that. Uh, I actually live in Houston, Texas. Uh, I'm a physician, a long term John Williams fan and uh, co-host of the Saving Private Ryan episode, which I really is still, uh, as you might guess, Star Wars, just because that was the first soundtrack album that I bought myself with my own money. And as I, I may have said in my episode, back before you could stream things or YouTube or whatever, if you wanted to re-experience what it was like to be in the movie, you could either go see the movie again, or you could just play the soundtrack. And Star Wars as a film was just so exhilarating and groundbreaking that, at least in my case, I just wanted to re-experience that as much as possible through, through the music. All right, thank you, sir. And next up, we have Doug Grieve. Yeah. Thank you, John, for having me on. This has been a great, uh, you know, I've been tar participating in many Zoom calls since our incarceration here for the last nine months, but uh, this is by far the uh, funnest I'm going to be on, so I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I uh, live in Orange County, California, uh, not far from uh, Hollywood, where uh, they're still making some magic up there. Um, my favorite score, uh, well, first of all, I have to say there are three I'm going to mention here. First is Superman, of course, because that's the one I helped co-host, and that was a great time, and thank you again for letting me do that. Uh, I have to say also Star Wars, just because as a theater goer, that's when I first heard the, the sound, right? You're sitting there, and you see this burst of orchestration come on the, on the screen. It was just amazing with everything that followed that, so that, that kind of got sucked me in, and then I I gotta say, I have a personal favorite, which is Fitzwilly, uh, which to me is kind of a fun, romantic uh, thing that Johnny Williams did back then. Uh, that uh, I uh, always uh, go to that movie; it's really fun and just a, a, a good way of of treating serious music with a very nonsensical movie. So I was very happy with that movie. Very interesting. All right, thank you, Doug. Uh, Chris Hat, tell us about yourself. Hello, Jeff. Hello, everyone. Love to see all these smiley faces. Um, so, uh, I was guest on two episodes: um, Cinderella, Liberty, the 1974 movie, uh, and also Star Wars. Um, uh, like everyone else, just impossible to pick a single score. I think if I had to save one from a, um, my burning house, it would probably be Close Encounters, just because I think it's just got everything but I would risk the flames and probably go and sneak E.T. I love that. Burning, if, I think that's a question I want to ask more often is if, you, if your house is burning, you can only say one score. All right, so um, Alex Hoffman, you're up next. Hey, uh, I'm Alex. Uh, I'm currently in Nebraska. I'm a college student uh, studying music education. I'm a trombone player, one of the many trombone players here. But um, I co-hosted on The Lost World Jurassic Park. Um, like everybody said, it's impossible to pick a favorite score, but uh, I'm going to have to go with Chris here. Uh, Close Encounters, nothing can match it. Excellent. All right, Sadiq Hussein. Hi, thanks, Jeff. Uh, and hello everybody. Um, I live just outside Birmingham in the UK and uh, I co-hosted with Jeff uh, Black Sunday from the early 70s and uh, The Phantom Menace, uh, the uh, reignition of the uh, prequel trilogy. Um, favourite scores? Well obviously it's very difficult. Um, it has to be Star Wars, the original Star Wars A New Hope because as other co-hosts have said, that was the score and the film that changed everything, not just for films, but for film scoring, certainly for, for me. But I didn't actually buy that score myself until after I bought The Empire Strikes Back. So the first score album that I bought myself was The Empire Strikes Back. Uh, but I have to also mention John Williams' scores for his um, Irving Allen um, TV series. I mean, I vividly remember Land of the Giants uh, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea um, uh, and um, uh, Time Tunnel, those scores. So even though I didn't know John Williams then, didn't know of him, the music was still fresh in my mind when I went to see Star Wars. I hadn't seen Jaws beforehand. Uh, I, I didn't see Jaws until many years afterwards. So Empire Strikes Back really for me. All right. 
Victor Joss. Yes, hello, and thank you for having me too. Um, so my name is Victor, and uh, I live in in France in a city called Rennes, uh, which is in the region called Bretagne, Brittany, and on the west coast. Um, I, I was a co-host on the Warhorse episode, and um, so. Yeah, if I had to pick scores that I love, I mean, the same, it's, it's so hard. I mean, I picked Warhorse when you asked about, I mean, when you asked us to, to pick a score for, to co-host with you, because it's the one I really remember that I uh, have seen in the theater for the first time in the movie. Uh, before that, I didn't, I didn't, don't remember like going to the movies, to, to the theater and watching a, a movie with a John Williams score. And there was Tintin and Warhorse, and uh, I have this really strong and vivid memory in my head. So um, that's why I chose it. I love it. I I would E.T. probably too. I don't know. The I love the last Star Wars scores, the three, the last three. I mean, all of them. But probably these these scores I would I would choose. Yeah. Okay. Next up is David K. Hello, everybody. Um. I am based in Berkeley, California, um, and the scores that I co-hosted an episode for were uh, E.T., Jurassic Park, and The Book Thief. Um, I think my favorite John Williams score is probably whichever one I'm listening to at the moment. Um, if I had to pick one, I'd probably go with Empire Strikes Back at the risk of being unoriginal. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. All right, so next up is uh, Brian Martel. Hello, everyone. Uh, Brian Martel, based in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. So with Eric, there's another Canadian. Um, I co-hosted uh, the Agger Sanction. I had a brief cameo on the Star Wars episode. Then... Uh, JFK, Amistad, and then Indiana Jones and Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Uh, so it was a, a fun time, enjoyable. Uh, also, just want to take the opportunity to thank all of you. I, I greatly enjoyed listening to your inputs. And uh, uh, I've mentioned to Jeff uh, when we were recording and in emails how often uh, you would love a score that I just had no did nothing for me, but yet after you talked about it, I'd had to go listen to it and found a new appreciation for it. So thank you all very much for that. Uh, favorite score, um, I was humiliated by, uh, I was doing a side gig, uh, doing some construction, and I was playing uh, not a Williams score, but a Goldsmith score. And uh, one of the construction guys was intrigued, and you like soundtrack music, and he found that interesting, and he said, so this is Jerry Goldsmith. I said, yeah, so what's your favorite Goldsmith score? To which I said, well, it's a mixture between um, Star Trek, the motion picture, or the Great Train Robbery. And he said, so that's what you listen to the most. And I said, oh, no. And he said, well, then they're not your favorite. The one your favorite is obviously the one you listen to the most, which made me laugh. And I said, well, then I guess it's under fire. So I would say The Empire Strikes Back is my favorite Williams score, except it's not the one I listen to the most. And so going by that, it would be, as other people said, Star Wars. Right. Uh, Empire is a close second, but no, Star Wars is the score I listen to the most. All right, Jim. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> yeah, it's, uh, it's really interesting to see how different everyone's faces look than I expected. Uh, <laughs> I find that really, uh, really interesting. So um, as Jeff said, I'm Jim Nova. I, uh, I live in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, and the episode that I hosted with Jeff was to my favorite of all the John Williams. Actually, it's my favorite film score, period, and my favorite film, Empire Strikes Back, of course. Although if I, it's really hard for me to, I mean, that's definitely number one. But my number two score is perfectly in, is uh, illustrated by my T-shirt. <laughs> I figure everyone's T-shirt game is pretty strong today, so I knew I had to I had to bring it. But uh, yeah, it's great to be with you all, and it's been really interesting to explore some of these scores that I had 
never even known before these this show so it's uh, it's quite an accomplishment you've gotten you've done here jeff of uh exploring all these scores it's hard to believe it's it's already come to an no kidding all right brian thompson hey um uh, my name is brian thompson um uh, i uh, live outside Asheville, north carolina in the u.s and uh the episode i did was uh Space camp, there you go. So um, that was yeah, one year ago, believe it or not. Um, so I did the Space Camp episode, really enjoyed it. And um, probably my favorite Williams score is like a lot of say, The Empire Strikes Back. Although honestly, Superman the movie is a really, really close thing. And, um, but in terms of kind of maybe more kind of lesser known slash hidden gems. Um, uh, definitely uh, Space Camp, of course, uh, high on my list. I also uh, really enjoy uh, The River. Um, I think that's a really, I think that's a really good one that, um, that just recently got, of course, a great re-release. So helps to uh, appreciate it. Cool. All right, so I skipped over somebody alphabetically. I'm not, I don't know why I did this. Uh, Felix, Felix Muller, go ahead. Hi, here's Felix uh, from Germany, originally from Munich, but this time I'm in LA. This my uh, small village is called Lachendorf. So the first two letters are LA. So you can say I'm from LA now calling because uh, from my mother's flat. Uh, she's not with us uh, anymore, but I think she will listen from above and she contributed much to uh, my appreciation for movie music. And um, I did this episode with this little guy. I don't know if you can see him. Uh, it's Tintin, uh, The Adventures of Tintin. And once um, a friend of mine asked me uh, if I have to take five Williams soundtracks on an island, that would also be a possibility, not a burning house, but also an island. Um, and I said uh, that time, Hook, uh, episode one from Star Wars, uh, Schindler's List, Harry Potter, and the fifth one was, uh, I don't remember, but uh, now it would be maybe also Tintin and um, Geisha. I, I like also very much. Interesting, nice selection there. All right, so next up is Eduardo Victoria. Hey everybody, so uh, it's so nice to see you all. Um, I am in LA as well, but uh, California, Los Angeles, uh, way on the other side of the world. And uh, I was a co-host on the, um, I think I have, I think, I hope this is the right one, score for Attacking the Car. I was a co-host on the War of the Worlds episode, um, which was a great, great joy uh, and pleasure to, to do. Uh, congratulations, Jeff, on, on coming to the end of, uh, of the run of episodes. If I had to pick my favorite, and I, I can't lie, so I have to say that I actually amazingly had the ability to tell John Williams this uh, when I met him once many years ago. My favorite score is War of the Worlds, not to go against the pack or anything. Um, certainly, it's, uh, you know, so many great ones to choose from, but that one in particular just always grabbed me ever since I first heard it all the way up, up to now. Excellent. All right, and our last co-host is Eric Woods. Thanks for uh, doing this, Jeff. This was uh, a lot of fun to listen to, and it was a lot of fun to uh, participate in. This might be the most um, research I've done for a show, or I think the most I've ever written <laughs> for a program. So um, first of all, I live in Kitchener, Ontario, Canada. I'm about an hour's drive west of Toronto. I had the pleasure of co-hosting Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom and I'm so glad I got that but I was I think two weeks late to get Raiders of the Lost Ark which is the one I really really wanted to do but then you offered me Last Crusade and I couldn't do it I wanted to do so many more but I'm really glad I got uh, I got one of the Indiana Jones films so but my favorite score of all time uh, and my favorite John Williams score and it's been this way since I was seven or eight years old it is raiders of the lost ark there is no other score that's brought me so much happiness so whenever i'm down 
That's the one I put on. But I think the most listened to one is The Empire Strikes Back, and that would be my very, very close second. And it's my second favorite score of all time as well. Yeah, I think we're getting consensus that Empire Strikes Back is the one for everybody. Um, I did forget somebody, and please forgive me, Jeff Owens, for doing this. But uh, yeah, I've skipped right over you for I don't know why, but take it away, Jeff. Hey, no problem, Jeff. Um, It's so good to see everybody's smiling faces. Um, I'm currently based in a little town in Texas called Hearst, which is in between the the big twin cities of Dallas and and Fort Worth. Um, I was uh, fortunate to co-host with Jeff um, on the Jaws episode, which was a lot of fun to do uh, and is one of my favorite John Williams scores for obvious reasons. Um, But if I had to pick my absolute favorite, it would have to be Star Wars. Um, It was just so groundbreaking. Uh, We actually had an old eight track uh, cassette of that uh, uh, score and uh, I wore it out. I actually still have the the cassette, it still works. Um, And so that, 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 that has to be my all time favorite. Wow, an eight track. That takes me back. Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing you have that. I, I think that's going to be a very big collector's item if you ever decide to get that off your hands. <laughs> that would be amazing. And if, if, yeah. if anybody has an 8-track player, I'm sure that would be big money for them because they probably, you know, that in itself is a big rarity. All right, cool. So this is great having everybody here. Um, I'm just going to just put this out there. This was not my idea. Um, so after Brian Martell and I had finished recording um, our episode for King of the Crystal Skull, we were talking and, and he asked me what I had planned to do for the finale, what I was going to do when all my episodes were done. And, and he said, well, why don't you just bring all your co-hosts together? We can all just talk about John Williams and shoot the breeze. And he, he didn't even have to finish the suggestion. I thought it was a great idea. And um, so it's, it's to you, Brian. I mean, you, you're the one who thought of this. And so I just want to thank you from, from, I guess, on behalf of everybody for, for thinking of this. So, um, yeah, thanks, Brian. Well, you're welcome. It was totally self-serving because, as I said, I totally enjoyed everyone's contributions. And there were a bunch of people I'd like to ask questions to and get to meet virtually uh, besides you. So uh, thank you for doing it. But uh, totally self-serving. So. Uh, I'm enjoying the moment. Well, we're going to get that opportunity for everybody to ask some questions a little bit later. Um, so we just, I got some questions I want to ask for a lot of people. Um, so it's kind of going to start with you, Brian, actually, because as you said, you, you actually co-hosted four episodes. You kind of, you and Polly has hold the record for the most episodes. And I guess you're four and a half, Brian, because you did yeah. contribute that little bit to, to Star Wars. Um, one of the things that, that really I, I couldn't forget um, a couple of weeks ago when Disney was, you know, making their announcement about all this stuff that they're going to be doing in the future is you said during our Crystal Skull episode that you doubt there was going to be a fifth Indiana Jones movie. And now mm-hmm. Lucasfilm and Disney have said that there definitely is going to be one. So what are your thoughts about that actually going to be happening? Uh, I didn't think so with the COVID uh, thing. Uh, I'm curious to see what they, they do. I think, uh, if I'm, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Eric, but I think you did a, a podcast talking about uh, what would be good for a fifth Indiana Jones movie, and I actually like what, what Eric mentioned as well. They should bring Tom Selleck in to be the antagonist. <laughs> yeah, Tom Selleck. And have the, the two Indies going at each other. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I worked with Tom Selleck. Don't don't mention Indiana Jones to him. He's it's apparently quite a sore spot for him. But oh. uh, but. Um, uh, yeah, I, I have no idea of uh, Harrison Ford, how how old well they'll play him or whatever. I, I like Indiana Jones. I'm one of the few ones that, despite the problems, I enjoy Crystal Skull. I, I, I hope it's uh, better written. I hope they, unlike uh, Last Crusade and Crystal Skull, I, I hope they, they, they did with both Temple of Doom and Raiders, just put the script through that one extra, one extra rewrite. But it, I'm looking forward to it. It's another Williams score. It's another Baton episode. We can all come back and talk talk about that one together. Is it? Do you think it's another one that... score? It's it's confirmed. That Spielberg's not involved, isn't it? Yeah, Spielberg's not doing. It. He's not directing it. I don't know if he may come in and be like executive producer or producer. But that actually brings up a subject: is 
He's John producing Goodman it. Said he's not, he said he's going to do it, but that was when Spielberg was attached to it. So, um, Eric, I'm going to pose this right. question to you first, and then you could kind of, anybody else could jump in. Do you think John Williams is still going to write the score? I think there's a few things that are going to come up that are going to, it's going to weigh one side or the other. It depends on what Spielberg's next film is. And if it's in the way of Indiana Jones 5, I don't see Williams going to Indy. He'll go to Spielberg. He hasn't worked with him for a really, really long time. Had to skip West Side Story. And um, so we'll see what happens. I'm not sure what's on Spielberg's radar um, after uh, West Side Story, but even with that being said, James Mangold's on board. His frequent collaborator was more, most frequent collaborators worked with other composers, is Marco Beltrami. And I would be very, very interested to hear uh, Beltrami's uh, take on uh, Indiana Jones. Um, but as I mentioned in that uh, Indiana Jones 4 episode, which is on my uh, site, I think they have to take Indy 5 in a totally different direction. Um, and especially with Mangold on board, if they pull off a, um, a Logan, way more serious, introspective um, look at Indiana Jones being old and being maybe forced into one last adventure, but it's not like the other four movies. Um, we're seeing a really old, frail guy, but he's forced into something. I just think that that would be more believable than having a 165-year-old Harrison Ford trying to act like a 30-year-old. And so that's where I think Indy 5 should go if they're going to get in, especially with the director that they have on board. I think they could do that, and I think people would actually be quite happy with that, and that being the swan song Do you think this could for, be the uh, transition Indiana into really old, decrepit Indy from Indiana Jones <laughs> Uh, and you know what? If he loses an eye, I would give That'd them full marks for that one. <laughs> oh, that would be so. But yeah, fun. you know, if if it's if it's you know if something happens, like if they want to get rid of Mutt, this is a way that they can do it. You know, his son dies. Now he's in a deep depression. He's drinking. You know, we we see him at a Mutt bar. And maybe he tells a story. You know, it's it's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I just think there's a there's a there's a chance here to do something really different with it. And and as they did differently with Logan. Um, I think that they can insert that into Indiana Jones and, and really separate it from, especially the mistake that I think that Indiana Jones 4 was, and really play to Harrison Ford's age and, and what could happen to a man of his sort and his age at that time. Right. Anybody else have any, any thoughts about idea. Indy 5? I don't think they um, should do it, but, you know, if they're going to do it, Eric's got a good idea. Yeah, I'm still I, not going kind to... Of Go ahead. Uh, I, I was going to say, I, I agree with Eric, but um, the one thing that just still makes me nervous is uh, Disney is in control now. And uh, they're very, um, as evidenced by the uh, Star Wars sequel trilogy, they're, they're very risk averse, um, I think, out of making potentially interesting story choices for their movies. Yeah, but Harrison Ford's going to argue back. You don't have Indy without Harrison Ford. And I, you know, he's the highlight of the sequel trilogy as far as I'm concerned. When he's gone, nobody really, it, it doesn't have the power. I, I think Harrison Ford, won't, he loves the character. He won't come back unless he's happy with the script. So if he's doing it, then there's got to be a script that he likes. Otherwise, he just won't do it. He doesn't need the money. So I, I really think that, um, Jeff, uh, Harrison Ford, Kathleen Kennedy, Lucasfilm, um, even George Lucas's influence will be there as well as Spielberg. So the fact that Spielberg isn't going to direct, I think there's too many big players who are outside of Disney sufficiently to have an influence and to take it in the direction they want it rather than what Disney wants. And I think Disney have had their fingers burnt with the sequel trilogy of Star Wars that they might be a little bit more amenable and I really do think that John Williams will do the music because as my co-hosts have said, um, colleagues have said that people like Harrison Ford and Spielberg and Lucas and Kathleen Kennedy and many others will have that sway. And if they say to John, we want you to do the music, he'll do it. I think he'll do it because it's much like the Star Wars. That's his thing. And 
Yeah, like the, the side ones, he's he didn't have interest in. But when you were doing the Skywalker saga, he wanted in. I, I don't think he's going to let an Indi like if it was going to be a mutt movie, I think Williams would be like let Marco Beltrami do it. But if it's going to be an indie, yeah. he's probably going to want to do it. it. It just seems to fit in with the way he's dealt with some of those franchises. He's been yeah. All right, cool. That's a very interesting discussion. We're just going to have to wait to see how this all plays out in the next, I guess, year and a half while they're, you know, in pre-production and production, and then they'll finally make some announce about who the composer is. Um, so I want to talk about, um, well, how about John Williams, but um, I think Jim and Eduardo are the only people that here that have actually had a conversation with John Williams. I think I'm correct. Raise your hand if you have, besides Jim and Eduardo, if you have actually talked to John Williams. David Kay, you never told me that. Maurizio. So I know, Maurizio, I know your brother did when he went to the concert in Vienna. Um, all right, so David, spill the beans. Uh, well, I was uh, in LA to see John Williams perform at the Hollywood Bowl. This was uh, probably at least five, six years ago. And uh, for those who don't know, um, you can attend the rehearsals for free, which happen, you know, th the day of the evening concerts. And uh, afterwards, um, sometimes he comes out and, you know, meets fans who, who wait outside the artist entrance. Um, and so I came um, with my mom and we had a sign that basically said, I'm a huge fan, can I just shake your hand? Um, which I think was a way, you know, one of the things is outside of those concert venues, there's always people who are just there to get posters signed that they can then just sell on eBay, um, which, you know, no, no judgment about that. But I think probably John Williams is less interested in interacting with, with those people. Um, the sign was kind of a way to indicate that, like, <coughs> I'm just a fan and it would just mean a lot to me if, if I could have some interaction with you. Um, so he did stop by, uh, we talked for like, you know, 20 to 30 seconds. It wasn't a long conversation, uh, and we got a photo, um, but it was definitely one of the, the high, the high points in my John Williams fandom. Wow. That's amazing. I didn't know that. I've gone to like five Hollywood Bowl concerts and I never knew you can go watch those rehearsals for free. I would have, I would have done that. Even if I never got to meet him. I mean, that would be cool just to watch the rehearsal process. That's cool. All right, so Mauricio, the uh, the host of the legacy of John Williams. I guess it's no surprise you've met John Williams. So tell us your story. <laughs> well, it was uh, actually I don't want to brag uh, because I don't, it's not my character. But actually, I had the luck to meet John Williams three times in my life. So I'm basically the luckiest guy in the world. Uh, the first time was in Chicago in 2007. I went there to, from Italy to, to see John Williams conducting the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. And basically it's a story very similar to what David uh, told a minute ago. I waited for him at the backstage door of the artist's uh, entrance. And uh, basically there were just a few people waiting for him, strangely. I don't know, basically because it was very, very, very cool because it was November in Chicago, late November in Chicago. I can imagine you how cool it was and we were kind of uh, four people waiting for him and we you know he stopped by he said hello and signed uh, autographed cds and posters and i basically was able to say you know thank you for for your music and thank you for all the joy you brought to my life and i told him that i was very happy to to have seen the concert the magnificent concert he did with the chicago symphony and the second time around happened uh, in 2017 in Boston uh, through a friend of mine who was in touch with uh, John Williams uh, management. I was able to, you know, to be invited at the, in the green room of the Boston Symphony Orchestra after the concert he did in, uh, with the Boston Pops. And that was a much more, you know, um, a bit, little bit more longer in the sense that uh, when, you see, when you have people coming into the green room, John basically you know, speaks to you and wants to know who you are and, and what you do and so on. And basically I introduced myself. I was just starting my research work for the Legacy of John Williams website that I mentioned that I was planning to do like that. 
and he was very, very happy to know about that. And basically that was it. And the last time was in Vienna, last January, when he was there for, to conduct the Vienna Philharmonic. And since I talked with Anne-Sophie Mutter a few months earlier, uh, she was very, very kind to, to have me in into the backstage after the Sunday morning concert he did in Vienna. And again, I, that time around, I brought him a, a little gift, which was uh, basically the illustration that you see on the Legacy of John Williams website. My brother did that beautiful illustration, so we brought that to John Williams and again, I introduced myself. He seemed kind of to remember who I was <laughs> from the uh, meeting we had a few years earlier. But as you can imagine, he's the most gracious, kind, and, and really lovely man that we all you know, know of. So basically that was, you know, my, I had my very big lucky share of meeting with John Williams. So <laughs> basically that was a really, really an honor for me. That's amazing. Three times. I, I, I just, I would give anything for just once, just once, five minutes. Yeah, five minutes I know. I, I, know. Yeah. I consider myself very lucky because I know there are many, you know, may, so many fans, so many people who love uh, his music and really just want to say thank you to him. And I know that um, these days it's very difficult to approach uh, him in after concerts because there is, as David was saying, there is uh, so much people uh, crowding the backstage doors and concerts uh, just to, you know, to, to grab an autograph and so on. While there are much more people, I think, who just want to say hello and, and thank you, John, for, for, for the, all the joy that you... Hey, Jeff, can I ask something? Sure. Do we... Is John Williams aware of your podcast? And if if not, has, I mean, does he have like an agent or somebody that you've communicated with and said, hey, just thought I'd let you know that I, you know, have, have done this project? His, his, I, yes. The answer is yes, he is aware. Um, I contact, I, through his agent, I am, I am, I have been made aware that he, is aware that the podcast exists, how much of it he has listened to, I don't know. I just know that over the four emails I sent over the two years of making this podcast, that he's aware. Um, so that I don't, again, he, that I, I'd asked, I'd responded before I said, you know, is there any particular episode that he listened to and he liked, and I never got a response. I just, the agent had just mm -hmm. said, um, I, have, I have told Mr. Williams about your he's podcast and he has seen it. That's all. We've tried to get we've tried to get him for the Goldsmith Odyssey as a guest. Yeah, very elusive guy. Figured it'd be cool yeah. for him to talk about playing on you know playing on Studs Lone again and stuff like that. Like yeah. maybe he'd be more interested in talking about someone else. Probably. And, uh, their response was that he was just very busy working on things. Yeah, and uh, wasn't giving interviews at the time. Yeah, some some friends and I um, are working on a, a documentary about Bernard Herrmann, um, and our director. Um, reached out to um, his assistant, was able to get in touch with his assistant because, um, you know, we've heard the stories that Williams was was mentored by, by Bernard Herman. So we were hoping to get some of that firsthand. Um, but I believe all of that was occurring during the Star Wars um, sequel trilogy recording. So um, they never said no. Their response was always like, you know, like, thank, we thank you, but Mr. Williams yep. is, is very Sick. busy at this time. Please try back again. Um, and uh, now with, with COVID, that obviously like, complicates everything a little bit. Hey, Jeff. Yep. Uh, I just wanted to take a moment to uh, thank you for your incredible hard work um, and, and discipline to complete this huge undertaking. Uh, I know you're an athlete, and so you know all about discipline. But I just kind of wanted to ask, maybe for you know, for the group, what it feels like to complete such an undertaking. It's it's pretty monumental. Well, I'll say this: when you when I started this, I, you know, episode one eleven was so far out there that I didn't even see it. I couldn't even see it. I was just so focused on just each episode. And especially because I had made that kind of, I put that out there, this is gonna be every week. So I, I just wanted to make sure I got this out every week. And so 
you know, as I got closer, when I got to episode 100, I was like, oh my gosh, this is it. The end is coming. Um, that's when it really started to hit me. And um, I think it was when, when Brian and I did Crystal Skull, because that was, I think, his 100th score. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is really coming to an end. But I never really, you know, I was just so busy of, of not churning it out, because I don't want you to think I was just kind of doing this as a machine, but I was just kind of just making it happen. And yeah, I guess my, my years as an athlete really helps because you have to have the discipline, you have to put in the work and you, and you just have to keep going, even though there are times where you realize, yeah, this is not as easy because other things in your life are taking priority, but um, you make it work. And I think it was good for me to do it every week. And this is definitely Jens. This is not a knock on you guys at Golden with Odyssey. Um, I just knew that if I did this like, you know, <laughs> once a month or every other month, I'd be, you know, it would be five years later and I'd be, you know, something in my life would say, well, you can't do this anymore. So I just yeah. kind of knew that these two years were a really good opportunity for me. And as much as I would have liked to have been able to kind of take my time with it and maybe even research some scores and some things that were going on a particular year a little deeper. Um, I don't, I don't regret doing it every week. I think it kind of made it like a, let like me a, tell you a serial. My, my original concept for the show was a lot more like what you're doing. And uh, it was Yavar who really wanted to be completionist and super thorough Q. So that's why we're still in the great television year of 19. Yeah, please, please work quicker because I'm going to be dead by the time you get to the scores I really want to hear you talk about. Tell you Var to pick it up, Jens. Pick it up. Uh, that's right. The, the 60s is a sweet spot there when he starts taking off. So, yeah, we're, we're kind of waiting for that. But yeah. i, I got to add, Jeff, that having not done anything like this before uh, and you, know, you contacted me and the process was wonderful. Uh, you know, I was stumbling all over the place and I think you, you really helped me get through it. Um, you know, especially you're, you're, you're want to talk so much about this great gentleman and, and all the things he's done. And, and you really uh, put a good environment together for us co-hosts. I think it was, it was really good. I uh, just, uh, I wanted to come back again and I just didn't have it because I, I, I wanted to come back for the uh, uh, Sorcerer's Stone uh, just because that to me was a no win situation for John Williams. The books had taken off. Everybody in the cast was British separately. And he had to come in and write this thing to knock it out of the park and, you know, anything less and disaster, but he just, you know, ripped it uh, just like Babe Ruth coming up with the, with the bases loaded and two outs. He went it over the, went over the fence with it. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. for all your I think I'd just like to add as well. I mean, I think Douglas is right. The process um, worked really well, Jeff. I mean, um, you really got the, um, the organization of it. And I think you, you, committing to once a week i remember thinking right near the beginning when we first communicated uh you was only a few episodes in and i was thinking oh, i'm not really sure this is going to happen one episode every week that's got to be a tall order to do that but not only have you completed it but you've completed it magnificently in style and timed it perfectly to finish with um, the last star wars film and, and you couldn't have planned that any better, I don't think. So well done for that. Well, part of it was I got to get this done now and I wanted to get it done and, and I wanted to start it in the year of his 60th year of film scoring. And, um, and I just yeah. figured out the way the episodes were going, it was gonna be two years. And I figured, well, at the time they didn't, you know, episode nine wasn't out yet. And I figured, oh, I'll have episode nine on home video by the time I'm ready to get to that episode. So it was a little bit of planning for that. So. Um, yeah, thanks everybody. It's really great. Enough about me. It's not about me. <laughs> um, hey, I I, I want to talk about um, uh, Temple of Doom. And I have to give it up for Eric. Yes. Because to me, Temple of Doom is only second to uh, Jerry, Gary Smoth, Jerry Goldsmith's um, uh, Star Trek The Motion Picture as far as uh, 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 quality over the movie, right? I mean... Uh, uh, because you haven't uh, seen all the Goldsmith movies. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but I, I mean, come on, the the, the the Star Trek the motion picture is definitely uh, um, a, Omen a, three a line solid home run. Yeah, and then, um, but you know, Temple of Doom is right behind there as far as you know the the the, the, the quality, you know, in which we can get. I think this is a whole podcast to get into the quality of that picture versus the score. 
uh, and which you guys did magnificently, by the way, it was a great, great uh, uh, cost test. But um, I think uh, that was definitely was, my, this guy's actually defending the movie. I can't believe that. So it was, it was fun to see that uh, uh, to, to done with such rigor. Didn't convince me, but it was, it was fun to see the attempt. I just want to, I mean, I want to thank Jeff because I mean, I'm with my own show, I'm always uber prepared and I write a ton and I'm not sure how long we were at like 10, 12 pages by the time we're finished, Jeff. It was about 12 pages. Maybe yeah. 80% of it was me alone. And I can remember talking to him like, I'm just going to type and you can get rid of everything that you want. I think there's a middle section where I'm on for about 10 minutes. And I think it was everything to do with the middle of the film um, through the blood tunnel and, and the Temple of Doom uh, chants and whatnot. And that's one thing I really appreciated also listening to all the other episodes was that um, Jeff allowed the co-hosts to say basically whatever they, they wanted. Like it's Their opinions mattered, even though if Jeff didn't agree or if the co-host didn't agree, I really think that he gave all of us an opportunity to to say our piece and even and even more. And but yeah, it was great for me because I mean, even though I didn't get Raiders, I mean, Temple is the film that I will defend to to my death. And I I'm glad that he allowed me to, I mean, dig not only deep into the music, but also the story, the characters, the controversy and whatnot. And I, I did my best. I, I tried oh, really no, hard. I, I tried hard to convince it was a great, it was a great, was great. <laughs> great episode. I, 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 again, I, I already had my pre, Thanks. you know, uh, my pre attitudes about it saying, well, gosh, dang it. What a horrible mess. But, um, I think you did a great <laughs> job in there. I was really, uh, I thought you did really, really well. In that. Eric, I, I was going to say, I was jealous because that's the movie I really, wanted to do and uh i must say being a fellow canadian i agree with everything you said and in fact, after do star agree, wars do you agree with this though do you agree with this hey canadian teams go all the way they're better than the flames so there you go but uh and that would be the score after star wars is temple of doom that's the score i listen to the most i i love that score it's lots it's rich it's, it's, it's interesting you talk about temple of doom as jeff i was there were few movies and scores that your podcast really turned me around on and Temple of Doom was one of them. And it's, it's so fantastic. It's so nuanced and so original. Um, and I was lucky enough to get hold of the score. Uh, the, the sort of working score with all the orchestrator's notes in and everything and pouring over that is just the most incredible piece of mammoth. I mean, it, the task, before him was so huge. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. I know we've, everyone's spoken about golden ages and phases of John Williams' work. I don't know if there's anything post, was it 84, Temple yep. of Doom? Post, yeah. post 84, I don't think there's anything that has that originality. So you can- No, I agree. I think oh, the yeah. energy is incredible. It's right at that tail end of that that you know 77 to 84 period where he was like even the crappiest movies he was working on it was all all gold and i'm not really sure i mean you guys can correct me if i'm wrong but i I don't know when the last time maybe he was hook when he really you can just tell just by the writing the orchestration that he was just having so much fun writing that's it it. Um, you just hear it throughout the whole whole movie you remember in jaws when when I, I, I if it was the point brought up on this podcast, the fact that the, the shark didn't work. So therefore Williams had to step up and fill in for Bruce, the, the broken shark, because his music pushed that movie towards even boy, being more eerier and, and the tents. And I was just wondering if maybe John was trying to save Temple of Doom <laughs> in the same type of concept where he's saying, well, I got to write this thing really well because boy, this is a really dark movie. So um, it's, it was an interesting process, but it is a glorious score. I mean, there's just nothing. I just appreciate it. I think, that's abs- I think that's absolutely true, Douglas. I mean, it, not just um, Temple of Doom it, that has its problems, but even the original Star Wars that had issues in the editing, that, that had uh, issues in some of the scenes not quite working. George wasn't able to, to produce the film he really wanted to. And he himself has said that the film he ended up with, he was only X percent happy with. But as soon as he heard Williams's music, 
attached to it, it elevated that film. And of course, we're all here sitting testament to that, that it did. And there's many a film that John's music has elevated to a whole new level. I mean, I don't think Hook is a perfect film by any stretch, but boy, is that score perfect. Uh, I mean, Hook is one of the best scores outside of the Star Wars or Indiana Jones series, I think, uh, po with the possible exception of The Prisoner of Azkaban, which I think is pretty good as well. But Hook, it's the score that I certainly listen to the most outside of Empire. I think uh, I another thing that uh, it's probably right to mention is the fact that uh, scores like Temple of Doom, uh, Hook, Empire Strikes Back are all very extroverted in the says that there are scores that really wants themselves to be heard. You know, John Williams wasn't afraid to, uh, you know, to, to write big scale music, not just because those were big event movies and, you know, with lots of special effects, lots of action, but also because he was aware probably that while he was serving the narrative and the story uh, and, you know, he was following the director's requests, he was was also able to that he he was able to realize that he had a platform that he could use to you know to make great symphonic music be heard to millions of people and this is something that probably is not really talked a lot because it seems like you know many things surely happen by chance because he was the right man doing the right job at the right moment with the right movie but at the same time i think after star wars and then Superman, and then uh, Close Encounters. By you know, by the time he accepted to also to be the conductor of the Boston Pops, uh, something clicked in him, and he was able to you know to realize that he was doing something that was really appreciated and heard by we can say billions of people. <clears throat> I I actually think the Temple of Doom is so lush because if you go back to the period and. I think I'm the old coot in the room with a couple other guys. I remember it well. There was a big shift going on. I, um, you know, Spielberg was very um, open that he's going to go on and do more adult things. George Lucas, Star Wars was done. I'm done with this. At, in '84, there was a sense that the, you know, the the Wonderkins were going to do something different, and I think that's part of the fun for me of Temple of Doom, Doug, is that it's it's over the top. It's Spielberg and Lucas just going, we're never going to do this again all out, let's just go crazy. And I think that Williams just said, I'm never going to get to write a score like this again. I had a good time with these guys. This is the last time I'm ever going to be able to write like this again. And he just, he just pulled out the stops with that too. And, and actually in filmmaking, that is, that is really funny is the fact that when you give these directors, and I don't care who it is, when you give them a blank check, they, they somehow get themselves in a corner. And I think that's probably what happened with Temple of Doom, right? Because, hey, you're going to do an Indiana, Indiana Jones sequel? Absolutely. Blank check, baby. Go do it. And I think Spielberg ran with it. And I think that's the reason I think it's a little bit too long, too, lot, too, too much stuff. Um, but uh, the score? <laughs> Can't argue. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's, it's a great score. It is a great score. Yeah, fan, it, it really is. And I and Eric actually kind of convinced me about a lot of the things that are going on with it because I, I, for many years, I just thought it was just mostly noise. It was just noise in some places. And it was like, why do we need music for this? But I mean, Eric really spilled it out. And, and I guess I never even really knew until, you know, again, Eric really highlighted this is that there was a theme for Pancot Palace. I never, I mean, I just thought that almost that whole portion of the film kind of noise but just that there was there was melodic structure for that for the palace and you know you don't have to do that I mean he didn't have to do that and then he did I mean that's just it just shows how great he he how much he really wanted to do it I mean he could have just said all right this is a lot I'm just going to just make noise but he, he really put a lot of effort into it and I think as we've all realized it, it's really remarkable when you break it down at least.